Hello, and welcome to episode three of the rigging module in the Anamorphic Cookbook. In this episode, I'll cover several accessories that make or break your life on set. I'll start talking about monitors, then wireless video, and end with follow focuses, both remote and on board. This leaves mat boxes and power sources for the next episode. Let's begin with the monitor. Filming with Anamorphix means that your camera records a squeezed image. As we saw in Module 3, very few cameras beyond Lumix offer extensive de-squeeze support. This added to the fact that it's really hard to evaluate critical focus on such tiny screens make for the case for an external monitor that is, A, between five and seven inches, and B, gives you multiple de-squeeze options. This selection also includes monitors that work as external recorders. For my rig here, I'll use a Shogun Connect, which falls into the monitor slash recorder category. I personally prefer a seven inch screen because things are easier to see. When it comes to placing it on the rig, I recommend attaching it on top of the camera if you're using a tripod. In our battle against wobble caused by single contact points, I'm using a swivel part with locating pins that will securely attach to the cage or handle and to the monitor. I strongly recommend a monitor with locating pin slots like these, otherwise they will easily spin. If you're using the camera at shoulder level, a magic arm is the best way to offset the placement of the monitor so it's comfortably in front of you. Beware of placing it too far back as the weight distribution and neck gymnastics will make you regret that choice before the first half of the day is over. For the arm, I recommend locating pins as well. The one I'm using here is the Hawk Lock and it works as a quick release mechanism as well. For your monitor choice, Go with something bright with at least 1500 nits or more that takes your camera output, HDMI or SDI, and gives you adequate de-squeeze options. There are tons of cheap and light monitors out there, so take your pick. I've gone through many. The Shogun Connect and the Small HD 702 Touch are the only two that I kept. They are on the pricey side of the spectrum, but they offer intuitive operation plus the features available cover all my needs. Our monitor needs input from the camera. Here I'm using an HDMI cable and power. For now, this NPF battery will do, but we'll streamline that in the next episode. I advise you pick a monitor that has not only slots for video input, but also output, sending the signal forward. It'll come in handy when you need more than just your eyes on the frame. This is the perfect segue into wireless video. Chances are you are working with a crew, which might include a director, producer, first AC, or a script supervisor. And giving them access to what you and the camera see is key. Wireless video is the best way to share your framing. We have come a long way in the last few years on budget options for sending signals through the air. A cheaper wireless system is going to cost you between 200 and 700 bucks with good offerings by Axoon and Holyland. Most affordable systems transmit up to 1080p signals, which is all right for smaller monitors and cell phones or tablets. In the realm of anamorphics, you can benefit from a 4K signal sent to your first AC's monitor for critical focusing, for example. But if you don't have a 4K screen to see the full res image, there's no point in going for a wireless 4K system. The amount of information sent out by the transmitter also plays a role in this choice. If you send more information, the signal is slower, adding more latency or delay between what's happening in front of the camera and what's showing up on the monitor. For this reason, most transmitters give you three options. One, a more detailed image, although slower, which might be fine for a director or a script supervisor. Two, a faster signal with less detail, which is ideal for a first AC who has to address focus racks as quickly as the camera moves. And three, a balance between both. Personally, I don't see the appeal of balanced as that feels like a lose-lose situation. Not enough detail for the best looks, not enough speed for quick reactions and focus racks. Just like the monitor, our wireless video transmitter needs power and signal. So I'll run an HDMI cable from the monitor. I like to keep these as short as I can. Last, as I'm constantly adding the transmitter to the rig and taking it out, 
I really like to have it set on a quick release system like the Hawk Locks here. This means I can easily mount and remove this part of my build according to the project's needs. Before we get to the fall focus, I'd like to quickly walk you through a good build for a remote first AC station. This station, disconnected from the camera, is where your focus puller will live. It starts with a cheese plate and a quick release bit to the far end of it, where the wireless video receiver will rest. My monitor of choice is Small HD 702 Touch with a V-Lock mount. Small Rig's monitor cage gives me plenty of mounting points. I'll use the same swivel head we had on the camera to connect the monitor to the cheese plate, but keep it adjustable. Let's run a short HDMI or SDI cable between the receiver and the monitor. Add a V-Lock battery to power the monitor and run a D-Tap to barrel cable from the battery to the receiver. Even better, since the small rig battery give us so many connections, I'll run a USB to USB-C cable to power the receiver. Next, we'll add a magic arm under the cheese plate and connect small rig's fizz handset to it, giving us good mobility to find a comfortable position. Since we have more USB ports on the battery, I'll run another one to the fizz so it can live forever. Fizz, if you're not familiar with the term, means focus, iris, and zoom an acronym for the handset that controls all the motors. The last thing we'll do for our focus station is to screw a spud to 3 eighths of an inch or a quarter inch adapter so we can quickly mount it to a light stand. You could screw it directly to the top of some stands, but I find the adapter a much safer and faster alternative. Now that our remote focus station is all done, it's time to talk about follow focus options. I'll first talk about things that work for both anamorphic lenses and adapters and finish the episode with an alternative dedicated to struggles that are unique to adapters. A follow focus is a piece of kit that gives you more accurate and flexible control over the focus mechanism of a lens. First, using a follow focus that's on board or attached to the rails, you no longer rack focus holding the lens barrel. This helps a lot with keeping the camera straight as I usually roll it a bit when pulling from the barrel. Second, the crank gives you another point of contact with the rig, making it more stable when handheld. An onboard follow focus is ideal when you're operating the camera and also pulling focus. It gets awkward to have someone else operating an onboard follow focus while you try to move the camera around. Hence, a remote follow focus is perfect for when you have a first AC or focus puller. When assessing an onboard follow focus, you want to make sure that there is no play between the crank and the gear. To check for it, hold the gear and give a light back and forth twist to the crank. It shouldn't move at all. Just like rigging parts to the camera, play or wobble here will impact your experience on set. A follow focus with a lot of play will give you inconsistent racks and make it harder to hit the marks. Other useful functions you might want in an onboard follow focus are hard A and B marks for specific moves and a removable witness knob where you can add lens marks or simple dry erase marks and wipe them out later. All the features we just saw for onboard follow focuses also apply to their remote counterparts, except they do it without the focus puller having to touch the camera. The one key difference a remote follow focus has compared to an onboard is you need to calibrate the motor every time you swing the lens. This step teaches the motor where is the minimum focus, then where is infinity. The result is that rotating the ring on the handset won't force the lens past its hard stops and will effectively give you a longer focus throw for lenses that have short throws. The next important thing about a remote follow focus is to check if it's powerful enough to turn all of your lenses. This is easier with new and modern mechanics, but can be a hassle with adapters or vintage anamorphics. Last, a remote follow focus needs power. Let's keep the trend going and feed it with an NPF battery. A good set of lenses will have consistent placement for their focus ring and featured geared rings, like what we see here with the Viltrox. This means that once we position our follow focus on the rails, we won't move it while using the same set of lenses. This is usually not true of adapter setups though, 
as the length of the taking lenses easily changes from short wides to long telephotos. This change affects the position of our focusing group, the variable diopter up front, meaning it might be necessary to reposition your follow focus every time you swing a lens. But what if we could change that? Inspired by members of our community, I'm rigging an extra third rail coming out of the rail block that holds the lens support. This one is offset from the main rails and it has the sole purpose of holding a follow focus controller for the variable diopter at the front. With this setup, the follow focus moves with the anamorphic block on lens changes, bypassing the need to adjust it every time the length of the rig changes because of the taking lens size. I am struggling here because the FVD24A is so wide that my third rail has to be pushed really far out. A smaller very diopter will have less trouble with this. A fancier alternative to offset the follow focus to the anamorphic block is the lens cuff. The lens cuff solves a few other problems too, but for now let's just rig it to the very front of the focuser with the 114mm version. And that gives us two rail slots where we can put our follow focus. Again, this moves with the system and it feels less awkward than the previous approach. The other issues that the lens cuff addresses is the play on the mount that comes from the torque applied by a follow focus. Direction changes or quick racks will make the image jump on camera. And this is something I can bet everyone has faced before. Not to mention a lot of times the motor will simply disengage from the gears in between shots or during a shot. The lens cuff centers that tangential torque by bolting around the lens body itself, meaning your motors should never slip and your image will never jump. They come in a variety of sizes and spacers, plus you can always 3D print a custom spacer if you get in trouble. Our rig is looking a lot beefier, and one thing that's bothering me are all these NPF batteries. I'll address that in the next episode by talking about power options and discuss in detail the impacts of using a matte box. For now, we've accomplished a better viewing screen, we shared what the camera sees with the rest of the team, and refine our control over focus. These are all big improvements towards a rig for every occasion, whether you're filming anamorphic or not. If you liked the lesson, consider becoming a member of the channel to get early access to cookbook material, plus access to a very special community of collaborators on our members-only Discord server. Memberships are cheap and help greatly towards the quality of the videos that I put out. Thank you so much for your support. Chitta Fahadangs, out.